Hello, good afternoon, friends. And uh, we have this series, uh, the uh, CEC Gurukul series. And under this, we have a lecture program. And uh, that program is titled uh, "Romantic Trend in English Writing." We have been running it for some time now. And uh, today's lecture is going to be on William Hazlitt, who was a romantic thinker and uh, who uh, worked uh, at the th theory of uh, romanticism and the theory of the romantic view. Uh, you know that would look at things from its angle, and uh, this thinker we have, William Hazlitt, uh, at the center of uh, the writing of prose in the 19th century in the early part. And uh, on for this lecture, we have the um, expert Dr. Richa Bajaj, who teaches English literature in uh, Hindu College, Delhi University, and uh, she has done research on uh, poetry, and uh, she has uh, published papers in uh, international journals, and she has attended conferences. So now, without much ado, uh, I request Dr. Chabajaj to uh, give us uh, this lecture uh, on uh, Hazlitt, the Romantic Essayist. And in fact, when I think of this topic, I realize that uh, Romantic Essayist is a term that needs some explanation. So I would, in fact, uh, request Dr. Chabajaj to tell us as to what exactly is meant by uh, Romantic Essay Essayist. So yes. please begin your lecture. Thank you, Professor An Prakash. Uh, yes, I found that um, in the romantic literature we tend to focus on the lyric mm. so much that we actually um, uh, overlook other forms. Mm. In fact, um, not really entirely, perhaps drama too receives some attention uh, because of writers dabbling with uh, you know the the uh, the dramatic form mm. but i and essays um, of romantic poets also is something that is seen as a kind of a manifesto of their writings so uh, it's only as a kind of a supplementary material and it becomes a kind of a background to seeing their poetry and in fact in their essays uh, they seem to uh, outline what they uh, wish to do in their poetry so um, essays of those sorts of course have been talked about for instance uh, Wordsworth's lyrical ballad, the preface to the lyrical ballads, or when we speak of Shelley and his defense of poetry. So, uh, these kind of writings are available, or for that matter, when we take extracts of negative capability from Keats, uh, these become backgrounds to their poetry. What Do they really help in understanding romantic poetry, such as says, uh, such prose analyses? Or uh, that's uh, that's why. So that's something that I want to uh, talk about. That they help insofar as their own poetry is concerned, mm -hmm. and their own idea of poetry is concerned. The mm -hmm. kind of uh, venture that they have undertaken. Mm -hmm. So uh, romantic poets are also distinct in their own ways, and uh, even as we try to fit them as and put them in a category of romantic poetry, they have uh, charted out their own territory and uh, they seem to work on that territory they seem to be writing based on certain principles and ideas that they hold dear after and for each e mm. it, it mm. changes mm. Yes. after this theory you can start the discussion on yes William on Hazlitt. Hazlitt. Yes. so but what i wanted to talk about uh, why i wanted to talk about Hazlitt was that here is an essayist who is not actually uh, promoting his kind of poetry because Hazlitt is not known to uh, in fact uh, uh, is not known to have written poems he is very poetic and there are uh, you know he freely uses poems from uh, places from Shakespeare, from Chaucer, Spencer to and quotes them in his essays. But he, it's not a poet's manifesto. It's not a poet's essay. He is an essayist in his own right. And he's a writer, he's a critic, he's a literary critic as also a philosopher. So, you know, it's a kind of a different blend and it's not something that we have so far focused on in romantic literature. Here is a person who is trying to uh, build a model of writing, build a kind of writing which is very different. It's a critical, uh, you know, it's it's basically critical writing that he is projecting or writing uh, in that period. Do I understand him correctly? Uh, if I say that you know, uh, Hazlitt uh, is not writing about the creative process as to how poetry is written or is to be written. He talks about what poetry is and yes. he would be as good as any poet when he speaks of poetry in general. That's actually one of uh, the essays that he, uh, the, you know, where he says uh, on poetry in general. So, uh, he has spoken on poetry, but he has spoken actually what is interesting about Hazlitt is that he has spoken about the poet mm -hmm. and what the poet has done and what is the role that poets have played in contemporary times. Mm. So, his is an evaluation or an analysis of romantic poetry and romantic poets. Which is not done by other uh, critics of the age. 
Yes. Mm. So, uh, no, there are other like Thomas T. Quincy has also undertaken uh, some of that work. Mm. But this is another branch of writing is what mm. I'm saying, where mm. we can place Thomas T. Quincy and Hazlitt together in that branch where they are looking at poets from a distance. Mm. They are looking at romantic poets and projecting or uh, providing an assessment of their work. Now, what we need to remember is that... Um, Hazlitt is writing has obviously has the uh, you know tradition of essay writing before him when we speak of the neoclassical age. Now in the Augustan period the essay uh, the the genre of the essay was established by Addison and Steele and Johnson so much so that it became kind of it received that kind of value and received in a kind of an authentic stamp uh, that people around could look to and you know then look at the poet through that prism. So, you know, uh, p people could look at literary figures, historical figures through the prism of the essay at that time. Now, that is what, that is the tradition that Hazlitt and others or the critical th he essays. He extends that tradition. He to extends the that century. tradition of essay writing mm. that was practiced in mm. the Augustan age. Mm. But then what we need to see, so what I'm trying to say today in this essay is that uh, you know, uh, just as poetry passes from one kind, so just as there is one kind of poetry written in the Augustan age and a break from that in the Romantic period and because of certain influences, a Romantic poetry emerges or comes into being. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the essay form was one thing in the Augustan age, but that through goes through a period of churning and uh, crisis and a, a kind of a rejuvenation of the genre takes place in the hands of people like Hazlitt and De Quincey. There is something very exciting in the sense, you know, that in the 18th century things were explained. Now, I think this writer is uh, instead of explaining, he is exploring. Yes. He's so, that's questions. what that's the difference that, you mm. know, I want to also bring out as to what is the difference? What, how the, es the genre of the essay has also undergone a change mm. in the romantic period and is not necessarily just a kind of an adjunct or a supplement to poetry, but stands in its own right as a kind of a literary activity. In fact, uh, what has happened um, from uh, uh, the uh, from the 18th century onwards, because of publication and because of reader growth and readership, what has happened is that the market has also influenced uh, readership and uh, has also influenced what we may call public opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, what has happened? in because of this change because of the historical change when that we can say that or and because of industrialization as well we can say that now the public is becoming involved in what is being written now uh, public opinion is important now readership cannot be kept in the background now in this particular phase of history people want to analyze people want subjects to be scrutinized oh. and analyzed literary figures to be scrutinized and analyzed to be just to, to be seen so there is a kind of a public debate that actually takes place no it's no more <coughs> that the reader is in some background as is unknown to the author of course but having said that the reader participates in the process of this public opinion that is formed on the uh, uh, on the poet and the reader looks at such critics for supplying this kind of uh, portrait. This is definitely a new development because what I feel as, uh, as as you explain the point that in the early 19th century people have started asking questions from the writers and the, and the critics hmm. and, and, and they have their queries and those queries have to be answered. Right. Mm. So, which is not the case in the 18th century. Right. Mm. No, in the 18th century the critic was also uh, a kind of a uh, moralist. Mm -hmm. You know, the critic was uh, was had uh, was also on a pedestal from where one mm -hmm. could satirize, one could uh, say what one a preacher, to an interpreter, yes, a person who would tell others also you know, criticize, or, or also, also criticize mm -hmm. from that pe pedestal uh, position that mm -hmm. one held. Mm -hmm. uh, here in this stage, because things are uh, changing so much that one, of course, uh, so when we say that. Uh, you know, the, a new thing is coming to the fore. We don't necessarily mean that everything from the that that, that has been borrowed from uh, the classics or the new classics has has been discarded. The tradition continues, but what is being said through the essay form, the content and the form of it itself goes through the change, goes mm. through change. But with the skills that they have learned, the uh, kind of um, 
uh, hist the position that now essay writing has or the power that it wields among readership because now journals are there now uh, people are constantly in the know of what's being written and what is being written about whom so also very interestingly this is also the period when no more can a critic um, just write about political stuff because he's been sponsored by some patron now that patronship has also gone no more of that patronizing sense of that you are writing for somebody now the critic is expected to write uh, genuinely about what is happening you know in the situation and in so there is the, of course the change is taking place but it means the critic does not now uh, bother also about the writer whom he was supposed to comment upon now the critic is uh, giving free his ideas in that his sense yes, yes. Mm -hmm. the critic is rather free because he is not even attack he may uh, exercise his right to speak of political affairs but he doesn't have to please a patron mm -hmm. uh, as it was the case earlier in the 1617 so till the 18th century patronage is weakening weakening and yes. the market forces are going of course so mm -hmm. the because the market because of industrial because of market forces the critic is rather free as an individual and has the responsibility to now uh, outline what literature should be and what literature is and there is a world of magazines coming up right. which is not the case earlier and so you see readership becomes very different when it is when so po one thing is what is being written creative piece and poetry is being written but then what is being said on that poetry that that itself shapes that poetry that these literary critics actually shape the creative work as well they give it meaning dimension and uh, taking into account uh, you know the kind of uh, the the flaws that may exist in this exercise as well this new point you are making is that uh, now is the atmosphere of debate right people are participating in the debate yeah, earlier yes. in the 18th century the right uh, the writer the, the essay to whoever was preaching his ideas there was debate in the 18th century and i think that's where the uh, that's what they have borrowed from the previous uh, generation of writers also mm -hmm. there was much there was there was this kind of uh, bitterness also and uh, sharp there was sharp exchange were there. and they were there. and was seriously mm -hmm. they do so mm -hmm. but here the writer is uh, and particularly when speaking of hazlitt what they do is that they they actually po uh, present these kind of sketches of writers mm -hmm. and uh, taking into account their psychology and their intellectual graph as to where they were and what they have become mm -hmm. in fact uh, when we speak of hazlitt has written biographical sketches of people uh, of writers mm -hmm. particularly and when he wrote these and these biographical sketches again came in a magazine you know there were a series of these essays that would come in magazines mm -hmm. and then and later on they were published in a form of a book but initially they were a series of articles or essays written on important literary figures such as mr wordsworth or mr coleridge etc when he talk about these poets yeah so did he make his points by taking details of the life of the poets of the time that's that's the interesting point so these are called the the very nature of biography also changes mm -hmm. in fact that's that's another kind of change that takes place now when biographical sketch, sketches are being written then they are not written uh, you know they are not meant to be histories or they are not meant to be histories of ambition and success of uh, these uh, literary Individual figures artists. or leaders mm -hmm. or these artists mm -hmm. these are in fact not even in that sense biographies because they take uh, they you know it's a kind of a, a portraiture it's a literary portraiture there there is a kind of portrait made of the writer mm -hmm. uh, through words and you know how that writer may have interacted with others so there is a kind of a personal correspondence you know in very modest settings intimate details projected and very less of you know the entire life of the person so these don't uh, give you information of where one is born etc but the intellectual tendencies that this writer has or and the propensities that this writer has mm -hmm. or you know what are the kind of um, uh you know wh what are his physical features like or uh, you know does he have these kind of very that, peculiar that, traits that he doesn't find very important no he he builds that he mm -hmm. builds them he builds the figure of a character mm -hmm. through certain physical so he'll give you physical features mm -hmm. he'll actually make that character come alive on a table mm -hmm. uh, while he talks and tells you how he moves his hand while talking or you know how he uh, takes a pause etc so he captures a moment rather than uh, a moment in the writer's Genealogy life and all. yeah mm -hmm. a moment in the writer's life and then talks about what that writer has done in the field of literature so mm. it's it's a very interesting and you know it's almost like a friend were talking to 
uh, us about uh, and the truth is that Hazlitt was friends with all these uh, uh, romantic poets, romantic poets. Mm. Uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge he came in touch with very early in life later on he earned the admiration of Shelley and Byron as well also he fought with all of them most of them actually and he uh, they became bitter enemies later on but he was very in close interaction he would interact with them so he knew exactly he would meet them and so they were friends and it was it's almost like a friends um, uh, you version know of. version of the poet mm. and so you know what is interesting in Hazlitt is he distances himself the he gets into the friend mode he'll give you a very intimate account of the writer mm. and then uh, distances himself and becomes the reader and or the, a, a critic who must look at the work uh, in its completeness as well as to what it has been able to do and what where it has reached are they separate uh, areas or the, 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 he is able to connect the two the, the, the personal biographical on one side and the writing on the other he is able to merge it actually mm. hazlitt is uh, he is very poetic and musical in his prose mm. um i'll when we come to uh, uh, you know the uh, the essays then mm. i'll probably quote one or two uh, passages also mm. where he is a uh, very poetical himself the way he talks it's almost like it could be converted into a poem because mm. he is he is able to bring the whole thing into a kind of a, an organic uh, unity mm. and uh, uh, it flows you know his his language his style is such that it one detail is uh, you know placed with the other as a kind of a uh, uh, painting he is also a painter by the way so and uh, uh, hazlitt is not like the 18th century essays so we're using you know humor and satire yeah, he's yeah. not using humor he uses satire. slight humor hmm. he'll use very uh, it's a kind of a hidden humor hmm. but uh, but very soon he'll move away there's a kind of genuine admiration that he shows the intimate very kind of uh, yes. Uh, yes yes also uh, not just that hmm. uh, you see very interesting in uh, what is what also very interesting in hazlitt's essays is that um, he pro he portrays this kind there is always this kind of a conflict that exists between the view that hazlitt held of poets when he first came in contact or first came in touch with them you know he's right he also writes on first meeting the poets so that kind of view that full of admiration and that awe and you that mean kind the of writer inspiring. brings his own personal experiences into the picture yes so and and he never says it what it, the, he never speak it speak in the first person mm -hmm. in that sense but he'd say that you know the the way he speaks it's it has that kind of charm and admiration and of near, the man and nearness with the with the poet whom, yes. whom he's talking nearness about yes will come later also but you know so there are two kinds of versions presented in these mm -hmm. biographical sketches mm -hmm. one is of the persons uh, the person who has uh, uh, who has just come in uh, contact with these people mm -hmm. and the view that this uh, this this young youthful energy that he had this kind of youthful nest that he had at that point what did he think of these writers and how they have moved on how what they have done on the way and what he thinks of them now so all, there's always a kind of a conflict that most of these writers what they set out to do they were not able to complete or accomplish what they what uh, what was expected of them does he complain or, or does he merely tell he tells it he doesn't complain so much but yes he's he's he looks concerned mm -hmm. uh, and you know towards the end he finishes his uh, essay with that kind of a note of where or what all are the flaws of the writer mm -hmm. where all he seems to be going uh, and how he has not been able to come up to the expectations of the people mm -hmm. so what is interesting is that these writers are supposed to come up to the expectations of the people they are meant to uh, deliver they are meant to uh, uh, maintain that kind of a st uh, stature that they did when they opened up when they came to the fore so and there is a disillusionment then uh, that Which gets that is attached to with is them. able to uh, pull the poets down to the level of the earth readers and there he makes them aware about their surroundings yes and, and questions that and you know questions. how they have mm. not been able to accomplish what they were meant to do mm. so now the poet is uh, uh, answerable in that sense you know so the poet uh, can no more become god and cannot take the position of that kind of a uh, a superior being which means that so the that literature has become a kind of combined effort there is a poet on one side the critic on the other they talk at the level of personal Hmm. and then the projector point of view and the reader and you the see reader. what the point hmm. is that the critic has become a kind of an interventionist yes who is trying to uh, 
break down uh, the poet's uh, emphases, his stance, his viewpoint, the meaning of it, etc., which the poet may not be able to do so for the benefit of the reader. So, it has come to the level of a kind of an integrated uh, uh, picture emerges when you have the poet and the critic on the other side and on the third, the reader who is witness to all this who is witness to the poetry and is also engaged in is the discussion. The reader, is the reader addressed by the by, by Hazlitt or uh, like the 18th century essays, they will talk to the reader. Hmm. But, but, but uh, Hazlitt I think is talking to the poets and he is let, letting the reader become aware of the dialogue that he is holding with the poets. Yes, but also what he does is that he is all he's giving an opinion on hmm. the poets hmm. and he is giving an opinion on the poets for the benefit of the reader who would be taking a copy of the quarterly review for instance and other journals hmm. where they would look at uh, what is being said of the poets. Hmm. So, he is giving biographical sketches for the reader because he has it is almost like uh, a conversation or uh, it, it has a conversational mode, but it is for the benefit of the reader mm. who might be interested in knowing what Wordsworth looks like close up. Yeah. I see. You know, mm. so in that sense, uh, there is a kind of uh, Hazlitt plays a role. He defines the poet for the reader and therefore, I am saying that he plays the role of the interventionist. Would it be uh, right to say that he dramatizes the criticism in the, in the early 90s century? It's very dramatic in his criticism. Mm -hmm. the, the criticism in his hand, that's why I'm saying it's not It's not like even a typical biography in that sense. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the person becomes alive on the, uh, at the table and mm -hmm. it's a kind of a dramatization of the entire scene. Mm -hmm. And that is what he presents to uh, the reader. Does he allow difference? Uh, difference of opinion with the person he's talking to? Or talking about, he's he 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 presents a picture mm -hmm. and then comments on it. You know, so he mm -hmm. he doesn't really he comments on if he disagrees with the person, then he comments on the points that that the other person lacks. Is he judgmental, or do, does that he interpret and modestly does so? He interprets and he is sharp and judgmental when it mm. comes to he doesn't mince words even mm. when so you can't actually see it coming when the way he uh, uh, shows admiration for the poet mm. you actually don't expect him to become sharp and he suddenly mm. turns mm. into this kind of a critic mm. with keen eye and uh, and notes certain points and you know humorously also pokes fun at some of them but you know it's in a way it's a kind it's a different kind of projection it's a different critical <coughs> it's a different kind of critical writing I do not know whether you would agree, but the, the kind of picture you are painting of, of Hazlitt here uh, shows that the person is very earnest, he is very involved in uh, whatever very, he is doing. Very true and he is he was known as the dissenter mm. in his own time and a dissenter would be a person who is not only against uh, the Tories, but against the established rule, against uh, orthodox religion and very pro French revolution. So, again uh, you know. Uh, romantic to the core. Romantic to the core mm. and he believes in fact you know. Um, it has been noted that uh, uh, Hazlitt was w among those very few uh, writers who never lost faith in who never uh, lost faith in Napoleon. Uh, unlike many of his uh, many of the contemporaries of the time who had what visualized a different world under mm. Napoleon mm. and then felt disillusioned, including Byron. Uh, who talks about uh, the fall of Nap Napoleon and how he had uh, betrayed uh, the cause etc. Hazlitt always you know Hazlitt very interestingly says at one place that I know only one alternative either there is the cause of the king and the cause of the people. So, if you are not with the cause of the king, then you yeah, are yeah, on the yeah. cause of the people. Mm. So, any shades or any kinds and for Napoleon for him w stood against the kings in whatever distortion and form he may exist. So, when he says that you know that there are only two possibilities available, either there is the cause of the king or the cause of the common people. Very clear kind of demarcation. There is a kind of a very clear mm. stance also mm. that he projects for him his own self. Mm. So, uh, he, he even if it means accepting somebody with uh, many shades of uh, you know grays and many kinds of problems within that person he would still take that person as the best option when it comes against the cause of the kings so you know he had that kind of clarity and uh, did he have faith in the people and the plebeians as uh, 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 this uh, napoleon would have napoleon completely what? agreed with the uh, cause of the uh, romantics hmm. and uh, that you know the subject of poetry had to be the common people in fact he talks about how he praises wordsworth for that very reason hmm. that uh, and you know i'll quote some of it from um, uh, from his works that how um, I in fact <laughs> uh, wordsworth was able to bring a kind of humility and a pride uh, uh, you know uh, to bring a kind of pride 
to humility mm -hmm. and also uh, talk uh, bring and uh, you know uh, reinforce the spirit of humanity mm -hmm. so he is very he is very much one with uh, the entire he would be very much one with the entire with manifesto the, uh, of wordsworth mm -hmm. and with uh, the values the common of people, the, uh, the values, values of, of the french revolution yes. and mm -hmm. you know he uh, often say that the revolution had in fact uh, what uh, what he c constantly believed and uh, would all, all given these statements that the french revolution was not just a kind of a social and political uh, a period of social and political crisis it was at the same time uh, a period of intellectual uh, moral and uh, in that sense imaginative rejuvenation mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know giving emphasis on the imaginative mm -hmm. that it's it wasn't just at the level of social and political uh, so, uh, you know society or that kind of that level that french revolution worked that it worked at the level of intellect it worked at the level of imagination as well and it led to kind of a uh, rejuvenation of all of that there is a new word that you have introduced in the meantime in mm -hmm. the discussion and that uh, word is imagination right. so far you didn't talk about it right so but what the exactly imagination, is imagination is very dear uh, for mm -hmm. uh, um, has lit again mm -hmm. and uh, he talks about and again when he is talking about all these poets when uh, of his own time then he is uh, building that logic that you know imagination is um, again when he talks about poetry then he says that poetry works through imagination mm -hmm. and in fact he says that a person who thinks who thinks who doesn't think poetry is important actually ho doesn't know how to respect himself he oh, says that uh, the person mm -hmm. can't respect himself and knows very little of oneself if one can't uh, give that kind of um, credence to poetry and imagination so in that sense uh, for him imagination is uh, you know is the is uh, uh, you know poetry is the result of that kind of imagination that human mind is able to create and in fact he says poetry is the expression of the poet of that imagination which all of us have so you know in that sense he's constantly the mental talking wake up about and, and the creative faculty that is there in all people right it is that which he tries to emulate he says that it is expressed by the poet mm -hmm. but again it's a different kind of poetry that comes to the fore in this particular period and he's trying to uh, uh, give it a kind of a form and shade and color uh, through his criticism which means that uh, if you give a kind of uh, summing up of this part of the discussion where you know the the uh, background the, the, the poets, the methods that they adopt, all that are concentrated into the attitude of uh, the, this person Hazlitt. So, in, in uh, later you can talk about Hazlitt as the as as, as the critic who uh, dealt with the question of the time. Yes, and maybe I can also bring in some biographical details. Yes, yes. Uh, please, please, uh, please sum it up and uh, uh, tell tell the viewer regarding uh, the points that you already made. So, uh, <laughs> the points that I have tried to make is that how uh, the, the genre of the essay also goes through change in the romantic period, mm -hmm. how it is ex it, it is an extension of the Augustan age and yet there is a kind of change and there is a break away from the, uh, the ethos and the values of the Augustan age and how new values and new va values based on the French revolutions, ideas of the revolutions, they in a way uh, structure structure the essay in a different form so that the even biographies biographical sketches don't appear to be just histories or just uh, reviews but are uh, you know a projection of the mental makeup and the inner psychology of the writer so now we require a kind of specific uh, you know uh, points that he made in his criticism and in his essays so, so I think that th this is a good thing and uh, th this should be now extended to the, that area where he was active as, as, as a person and, and as a thinker. Yes. So, uh, you know, we have already discussed uh, you know, the, the point regarding uh, his role uh, as, as a thinker and, and as a romantic essayist and the kind of sensibility that he had and his propensities. So, now maybe uh, is, is, the, is the next point and that will be regarding his uh, actual contribution to the romantic essay. Right. So, um, let us first uh, viewers look at uh, some of the life details of Hazlitt and what he has written is actually he was a prolific writer. Uh, let us look at uh, some of the details, you will have a better view. He was born in 1778. Let us try to 
map him in the century as well so born in 1778 uh, remember this is just the period between the two revolutions right and the american revolution has uh, just taken place and the french revolution is going to take place and he's going to be witness uh, to all these happenings plus this is also the beginning of the romantic period um so he he was there till about 1830 and uh, as you can see he was a prolific writer he was a humanist essayist and a literary critic he was a painter as well he in fact started his career as a painter he thought he'd become an artist he turned into an art critic as well he also did philosophy he studied philosophy and metaphysics and gave lectures on philosophy as well so so many things in one person actually it's quite um, it tells us about the very age uh, where uh, you know writers were not just were not just literateurs they uh, dabbled with many fields at the same time now look at his uh, childhood as well so he uh, spent his childhood in ireland and north america for a brief period his father was a preacher there and he but the family returned to england when he was 9 years old he uh, later on he he would not speak much so hazlitt actually took he read a lot but he could not express it so he actually turned to um, a painting and later on decided to work and study at the louvre in paris in 1803 but uh, soon uh, his uh, interest uh, in painting also dwindled and he turned to studying metaphysics and philosophy he published his first book of uh, essays on the principles of human action in 1805 now here he talks about uh, the philosophical principles as well and there's much study done on this book as from the from the philosophical point of view again he wrote extensively from this point onwards in his life hazlitt married in 1808 and uh, started um, in and around 1811 he started giving lectures on philosophy in london and soon he started also contributing articles to magazines uh, that were published in renowned journals and this also established him as a as a journalist and a critic uh, of the time import, uh, as a uh, important critic at the time he gained immense su immense success made friends with wordsworth and Coleridge at the time he also uh, gave courses on english poets in 1818 and on the english comic writers in 1819 these added to his literary acclaim also you know very interestingly you would find that uh, uh, courses and curriculum at that at this particular time in history also become important is now thing now english poets are studied as a kind of a and discussed threadbare english comic writers are discussed threadbare through these series of lectures that these romantic poets give and one cannot forget and cannot overlook the fact that shakespeare was re revived during the uh, romantic times through such critics so uh, you know they uh, has it actually is able to look into the inner psychology say of macbeth and so does coleridge so these lectures on so uh, on shakespeare also added uh, to uh, you know the 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 afterlife of shakespeare and so you see at this time academia and criticism or curricula becomes very important and uh, language uh, and literature is becoming established and more structured at this particular stage in history coming back to uh, the essays that uh, uh, hazlitt uh, wrote he uh, you know he he went through some difficult phase he he had a divorce with his wife he was he fell in love with another woman could not uh, uh, marry her for that period and also had financial difficulties so the, you know he brought about these two uh, collections of this famous books the table talk and the plain speaker that came out in 1821 and 1826 these were these actually have been known to be the best kind of Uh, writings of uh, uh, hazlitt he later on um, you know later on his son actually published sketches and essays in 1829 literary remains was published in 1836 winter slow in 1850 now these last two were published posthumously because uh, hazlitt died in 1830 So in 1825 Hazlitt published some of his most effective writing in the book The Spirit of the Age and that's that's also the much talked about book uh, of his and from where I'll also be quoting certain pieces he um, uh, brought out this kind of ambitious work uh, which was titled The Life of Napoleon in four volumes from 1828 to 30 and 30 is exactly the time when he dies uh, this of course has not received that kind of acclaim but uh, you know he that was his uh, uh, that was his dream to write about uh, napoleon 
again uh, his la last book conversations of jane's uh, north court recorded his long friendship with the painter and he also uh, talked uh, gave a lot of uh, art criticism uh, you know through the form of lectures and essays that he wrote uh, hazlitt's complete works in 13 volumes appeared in 1902 uh, and till about 1906 by pp hof and in again 21 volumes in 1930 and 34 so you can see this man has written so much that you know it it has now what we have today there are 21 volumes of his works and very little is still uh, known of william hazlitt uh, uh, you know and he is not not even counted amongst the romantic writers often that is missed uh, in these kind of um, uh, discussions let's look at what um, hazlitt has uh, said on poetry now uh, the first quote that uh, uh, i'm going to read for you is um, from his uh, lectures on english poets 1818 and in that uh, he writes uh, the first introductory essay is on poetry in general here uh, and this is written in 1818 so what what does he say about poetry let's have a look at that poetry he says is the universal language which the heart holds with nature and itself he who has a contempt for poetry cannot have much respect for himself or for anything else unquote that's the first quote that he gives of poetry now the idea is that the poetry is the universal language it is the common language that uh, exists that that binds that uh, brings people that brings uh, you know the community together and it is something that it is a universal language with the which the heart holds with nature and itself so in a way poetry actually unifies nature and the self of the person It, it it's it becomes that kind of joining link between poetry becomes that kind of joining link between the natural world outside and uh, the self of the person and this is not just the poet but the reader as well is equally important in this discussion let's look at what else does he say about poetry another uh, way of uh, dis, uh, you know uh, defining poetry hazlitt says the light of poetry is not only a direct but also a reflected light that while it shows us the object throws a sparkling radiance on all around it now uh, you see that's uh, uh, before i move on you, very interestingly it's not that it does not only illuminate the object that is being projected but it actually shows light on everything else around it it builds a kind of radiance it builds a kind of a uh, you know you 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 tend to have more insights on things around so when the, when there is a projection of the flower then you don't just see the flower you tend to see everything else around it in a way it it's not just so that's what he means when he says that it's not a direct light but also a reflected light that it shows the object but also brings into radiance everything else around it that's the idea of poetry that he is giving to continue he um, uh, he says the flame of the passions communicated to the imagination reveals to us as with a flash of lightning the inmost recesses of thought and penetrates our whole being now again so the so passion communicated to the imagination uh, brings about this kind uh, you know enters the innermost layers of our thought and uh, it, it, it and creates an impression there where what the word he says penetrates our whole being this is the influence this is the impact of poetry so passion mingled passions communicating to im, uh, imagination the ideas and that leaving an uh, a kind of an impact on the person this is the this is the way he uh, projects poetry in his discussion let's look at what romantic uh, what has led has to say about uh, the romantic poets now according to haslet the romantic poets founded a new school on a principle of sheer humanity on pure nature of art he suggests that all things are by nature equally fit subjects for poetry or that there is or that if there is any preference to be given the, those are the meanest and the most unpromising are the best as they leave the greatest scope for the unbounded stores of thought and fancy in the writer's own mind unquote let's look look at the uh, quote once again what he's try what haslet here is suggesting is that uh, what 
and this is where you know the idea of the french revolution or the uh, you know the idea of equality comes into being he says that the romantic school of thought has uh, built uh, poetry on the principle of sheer humanity on the pure nature of art that it doesn't need amplification it doesn't need artificiality it doesn't need to be uh, the subject of poetry does not necessarily have to be the courts and the kings and that all things by nature are equally fit subjects for poetry that there is no such thing as the fit subject for poetry that itself has changed in the romantic period and here he is giving voice to that he's he's giving a kind of a a perspective to romantic uh, school of thought and here he says that if at all one has to give preference to anything one he says each object in nature is fit for poetry then he says if at all we need to give preference to anything then the preference is to be given to the meanest the 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 meanest and the most unpromising these are the things which are the best subject of poetry because why because they leave greatest scope in the mind of the re, of the writer that uh, there is immense scope and unbounded stores of thought and fancy in the writer's own mind vis-a-vis -vis those meanest and unpro unpromising things those things which have been left aside those things that have never received notice these if at all should become should be preferred in poetry uh, of course the entire uh, way of thought has changed in the romantic period as you can see here these are from uh, the lectures on the english poet that hazlitt uh, talks about also hazlitt uh, you know uh, didn't of course give any kind of uh, you know he, he didn't believe in moral aesthetic judgments or any predetermined patterns he didn't believe in predetermined patterns given to poetry in fact he'd say that if if any kind of aesthetic or uh, elements of morality or values emerge then they should emerge from poetry itself and one must not impose from outside as it was done in the augustan age of course any kind of predetermined patterns on poetry let's uh, also uh, you know note this kind of critical acumen this is also very interestingly uh, you know you see hazlitt was a was an artist he was a painter so he had a very keen eye he had a very keen also ear for music he almost when he wrote his own pieces in you know, his own prose pieces he would uh, you know he would always think of the sound of them as well you know in the sense that they they almost sound musical but you know he is he because he is a painter he actually makes a critical assessment of uh, a contemporary poet uh, campbell who he uh, who he discusses in this in the following manner note what he says and i quote there are painters who trust more to the setting of their pictures than to the truth of the likeness mr campbell always seems to me to be thinking how his poetry will look when it comes to be hot pressed on super fine wove paper to have disproportionate eye to points and commas and dread of errors of the press Hazlitt's quote, Hazlitt's uh, uh, criticism, or uh, you can say the critical evaluation of Campbell, and he says that you know Campbell is a very uh, conscious poet. What he means to say is he's a very conscious poet. He's a very self-conscious poet who's actually more who thinks more about how his book would come out, how his book would be, how the end product of that book would be than the actual matter or uh, or what he's writing. now uh, of course is quite damning you know the way he's criti he criticizes campbell here but he goes on to say and i quote the uh, about campbell he uh, he says the following he is so afraid of doing wrong of making the smallest mistake that he does little or nothing lest he should wander <laughs> irretrievably from the right path mm. he stands still so you can see you know he he he's he, you know he's that, that's his poetic style that's his prose style you know which where he's and he's making a very fine point here mm -hmm. that you know mm -hmm. he he he's so afraid of making a mistake that he actually does nothing he does little or nothing and lest he should wander irretrievably from the right path he stands still without making a mistake how do you decide to intervene I yes only and and hmm. you see, what he says is he doesn't take that plunge you know mm -hmm. and he goes on to say he writes according to the established etiquettes he offers the muses no violence mm -hmm. if he lights upon a good thought he immediately drops it for fear of spoiling a good thing i think this is 18th century kind of writing yeah. writing yes which has <laughs> spilled sense. over so this mm -hmm. is one of those instances mm -hmm. where he is very uh, precisely and keenly uh, you know uh, interpreting mm -hmm. a writer's uh, way of working mm -hmm. 
so that's also a uh, very interesting hmm. no no I, I, that, that's the kind of comment that writers should be making right. know, that uh, if there is a problem in front of you first thing is to understand and hmm. and, and understanding itself is an act of courage right. and you may, may understand it wrongly yes but then that is better than ignoring it yes since you brought the context of the 18th century and how he's taken this from there uh, let's look at the critic francis ferguson he says in his essay representation restructured hmm. and i quote that uh, from one perspective, the British Romantics consolidated and extended trends that had become important for their 18th century predecessors. Mm -hmm. First, they took the periodical essay of Addison and Steele and Johnson mm -hmm. and published long-running reviews that treated the essay as a distinctive genre. Mm -hmm. Unquote. Then he goes on to say, Ferguson says, the essays of the periodical reviews provided a platform both for commenting on the occurrences of daily private and public life and for passing judgments on actual persons and literary work. Second, they extended the notion of public opinion, unquote. Mm -hmm. So this is the larger trend of the 18th century and uh, moving the movement uh, from 18th century to uh, 19th century. So, uh, uh, you see, uh, Ferguson goes on to say, literature now took itself uh, to represent republic of letters that not only expressed political views, but also submitted them for the approval of a new constituency, readers, largely unknown to the authors whose work they read. So, now they would be, so political views would be expressed, but they would be submitted to the, author the approval of the new constituency, namely the People. readers readers yes so can you throw more light on the republic of letters well, this, this is a phrase that, that is very true to the 90th century spirit hmm. uh, people would not talk like this you know in the 18th century and even today they wouldn't talk like this hmm. so literature has to be brought closer to the people as much as possible right this is so true. there is a kind of a restructuring of language and literature both mm -hmm. so now the it's and it becomes more participatory mm -hmm. it requires the approval of the people that the people must give it the stamp of uh, approval and so the republic of letters when he says literature now took itself to represent a republic of letters Right. So, Repl Republic of Letters means there is a kind of democracy mm -hmm. in within literature and within what is being written, where it becomes participatory, where everything is involved, where you see people from uh, very close quarters and uh, also have the right to object and scrutinize them and criticize them and you for, and for you failing. You, you recognize them as genuine human beings as oneself uh, one is. And therefore, that uh, idea of nature is to bind the people together. Right. Yeah. So, the republic and the idea of democracy actually enters literature at this mm. particular phase in history, uh, uh, obviously because of the influence of the French Revolution. Mm. So, how, how do you sum it up the discussion, the entire discussion uh, with respect to Hazlitt in the, in the early 19th century when he was active as, as, as a thinker and as a painter and, uh, and, and in other areas? Yes. So, uh, Hazlitt is, is, has been bred on that kind of that, uh, the 18th century tradition, but he has broken ties of with uh, that kind of an old way of thought mm -hmm. and he has deliberately moved in the direction of uh, uh, embracing change and writers at that time actually felt that, uh, you know, uh, that things were, uh, that it was a momentous period and that things were uh, uh, on the brink of change and that everything around them was going through through this kind of turmoil and change and they felt responsible for becoming agents of that change they including Wordsworth you know or, or for that when we speak of Hazlitt they became these kind of uh, figures who would uh, uh, accelerate the process of change and bring it direction so there is a kind of an added responsibility uh, that the romantic writers uh, the critics uh, feel uh, towards the populace towards the public and so the making of the public opinion becomes their kind of a uh, the the central role that they engage themselves uh, that they engage with that that the need to build a kind of public opinion the need to mobilize the people and uh, bring that uh, change uh, you know so the change becomes effective in England which the which is obviously happening elsewhere would you agree if I say that uh, even though it, the word romantic is used for them these people were bringing imagination to understand the actual life 
And so they were realists, high realists, you know, even though they were called romantics. Right. Yes. In fact, they felt that, uh, you know, uh, poetry or imagination or the, uh, the the medium of the imagination was a better way of understanding reality mm. than histories. Mm. And uh, uh, because history would be documentation, mm. here feeling and emotion mm. was equally involved. The passions of the romantic writer uh, was very important ingredient in all of, uh, you know, the p uh, writings available at the time. So, uh, 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 on this point of you know history, on, on the point of the people and 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 their bonding with it, with one another, that is the crux of romanticism, and that is very ably represented by William Hazlitt in his essays. So I think uh, we've had a new view of uh, you know Hazlitt and a new view of romanticism that uh, brings uh, literature closer to the uh, com life of the common people. So I think on this positive note, we come to the end of the discussion. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bajaj, for giving such a fine lecture on romanticism with so many insights. And viewers, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.